looking today into the story of the wise men and the Christmas star of Bethlehem, found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you haven't already read this passage as a group, why don't you pause right now and read it? 150 years ago, John H. Hopkins, Jr. penned the words and music of this haunting Christmas carol of the wise men. We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar. Great song. <laughs> but they weren't kings, we're pretty sure of that. Nor were there necessarily three of them, nor did they go by the names of Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. But who were they? And why did they come? How do they fit into the story of Jesus' infancy? Let's follow the story as Matthew tells it in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. All of a sudden, an elaborate entourage from the east appears in Jerusalem at Herod's court, inquiring about the birth of the King of the Jews. These men are described as wise men or magi. The Greek word is magos, a Persian, then also Babylonian wise man and priest who was expert in astrology, interpretation of dreams, and various other occult arts. Well, where are they from? The text says, the east, the direction from which the sun rises. And, and where could that be? There are three main possibilities. First, Parthia or Persia. The term Magoi was first associated with the Medes and the Persians. We know that astrology flourished in this area and that the astral lore of the region was applied to royal births. A second possibility is Babylon. The Babylonians, or Chaldeans, had a well-developed interest in astronomy and astrology. A large colony of Jews remained there, so astrologers could have learned of Jewish messianic expectations. Also, Magoi are referred to in Daniel's description of the Babylonian court. The third possibility is Arabia, or the Syrian desert. The gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are associated with desert camel trains coming from Midian in northwest Arabia or Sheba in southwest Arabia. Astrology was not unknown, and Jewish colonies existed in various cities. Which of these is most likely? <laughs> well, we can't really say. At any rate, they were men of wisdom and learning from an exotic, faraway land bringing a caravan into the capital city of the Jews, seeking a newborn king and they certainly must have attracted attention. Verse 2 recounts their question that was asked in Herod's court. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. This word star or aster wasn't used in a modern scientific sense. Rather, it referred to a luminous body other than the sun, visible in the sky, star, single star, planet. The Greek word aster almost always denotes a single star, whereas astron could also be used for a constellation. This phrase, in the east, in verses 2 and 9, may well carry the meaning at its rising, or the upward movement of celestial bodies. So here are some of the possibilities of what this was. First of all, it could have been a supernova, or a new star. A supernova is an explosion in an existing star that for several weeks or months gives out a great deal of light, sometimes even visible during the day. A dozen novae are discovered every year, but those visible to the naked eye are rare. There is no historical record of a supernova just before Jesus' birth date. Second, it could be a comet. Throughout history, comets have captured human imagination. A comet's nucleus is made up of rock, dust, and ices. Its tail can be spectacular. 
The sun's radiation pressure and solar wind cause a very long tail to form, which points away from the sun. Astronomers have calculated that Halley's Comet would have been visible 12 to 11 BC, years before Jesus' birth, about 6 BC. A third possibility is a planetary conjunction. Astrologers pay attention to the planets. Apparently, there was a conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars that occurred in 7 to 6 BC, and mention seems to have been made of this in cuneiform texts. Some have gone farther. This series of conjunctions over several months took place in the zodiacal constellation of Pisces, which may have been associated with the last days and with the Hebrews. Jupiter was associated with the world ruler among Parthian astrologers. Saturn was identified as the star of the Amorites of the Syrian-Palestine region. These three indicators could have pointed to a world ruler among the Hebrews in the last days. But this is purely speculative. Astrology by hindsight, you might call it. Nor do we have any evidence that such a conjunction of planets would have actually been referred to as a star. We just don't know enough to say authoritatively exactly what the star of Bethlehem was. There is a star spoken of in prophecy, however, in a prophecy of Balaam, the errant prophet, in Numbers 24, 17. It goes, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. The initial reference seems to be to David. Prior to Christ, Jews of the Qumran community saw this prophecy as messianic. Later Judaism considered the messianic claims of Simon bar Kokhba, means son of the star, who lived 132 to 135 AD. Could the messianic expectation based on this verse among Jewish communities in the East be the basis of the Magi's interpretation of the star? We don't know. But let's pause now for discussion question 1, based on Matthew 2, 1 and 2, and then this passage in Numbers 24, 17. What is the significance of the star of Bethlehem that the Magi saw? Why do you think the Magi came to find the Christ child when they saw the star? In what way does this prophecy prefigure this event? Pause the DB now and discuss this, and then turn it on again when you finish discussing. Verse 3 records, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. A delegation of important people coming to Jerusalem to honor the king or to worship in the temple wouldn't be uncommon. But the Magi's search for a newborn king based on an astronomical phenomenon created quite a stir. The Greek word here means to be troubled, frightened, terrified. Herod was troubled because he saw this newborn as a threat to his own throne. The people were troubled because they had seen what their paranoid king had done when he felt his throne threatened. A later Roman philosopher quotes Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus as joking, I'd rather be Herod's sow than Herod's son. Herod didn't eat pigs, but he murdered his sons. Herod takes the Magi's quest quite seriously. Here are verses 4 through 6 quoting the prophet Micah. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Note that the Magi came seeking the one who has been born king of the Jews. But Herod asked the scholars where the Messiah, the Greek word is Christos, would be born. Herod understood immediately that this child they sought was no normal king, but the Messiah himself. 
Herod wasn't a descendant of David. He was rather an Edomite, son of a ruling family in whom the Romans had seen a talent for controlling the populace. He had been appointed governor of Galilee in 47 BC and later king of the Jews in 37 BC. Herod realized that if a descendant of David were to rise, his reign and that of his descendants would be over. Messiah or not, this child must be destroyed. The prophet Micah had made it clear that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah, Micah 5.2. So in Bethlehem, the quest would continue. Let me read verses 7 and 8. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Herod's questioning of the scholars was public, but his interrogation of the Magi is secret. He finds out precisely when the star appeared. Later, he uses this information to slaughter all the boy babies in Bethlehem two years old and under. Apparently, the Magi had seen the sign two years previous. Now, in verse 8, Herod seeks to enlist the Magi as his secret agents. As soon as you find him, report to me. He claims the desire to worship the newborn Messiah, but his real desire is assassination. The story continues in verses 9 through 10. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. It seems that they had seen the star at its rising, or in the east, and had come to Jerusalem since that is where they expected to find a newborn king of the Jews. But now the star, which seems to have disappeared for a while, now reappears and went ahead of them. Finally, the star stopped or stood over the place where the child was. The star that inspired their trip in the first place now leads them directly to the very home where the Christ child dwelt. Verse 11 begins, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. By this time, presumably, Two years after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph were living in a house. While most nativity scenes have shepherds bumping into wise men and angels, this almost certainly was not the case. The Holy Family had left the stable and found a house. Probably Joseph had found employment as a carpenter. They had apparently decided not to return to Nazareth, perhaps because of the scandal over Mary's pregnancy prior to the marriage. We don't know. But now... Outside their home, a caravan of exotic travelers has stopped. Strangely dressed men are approaching while their camels are attended by servants, while other servants are carrying gifts in their hands. Mary scurries around to straighten up while Joseph goes out to meet the strangers. The word translated worship here means literally kiss towards. It denotes uh, to express in attitude or gesture one's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority figure, fall down and worship, do obeisance to, prostrate oneself before, do reverence to, welcome respectfully. We're not told the details, of course, but when the Magi see the child, now a toddler, they bow down and worship him. Imagine these old men, finely dressed, prostrating themselves on a dirt floor before a small child. They had seen the star, and it had reappeared to guide them. These men were convinced, rightly, that they were standing before the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Their obeisance was fitting. Well, let's pause now for discussion question two, based on Matthew verse 11. What do we learn from seeing the Magi prostrating themselves before the child Jesus. What was the significance of this for them? And how can we emulate this kind of worship? Pause now.
for discussion and then turn the DVD on when you've finished. After lying prostrate for some time, they rise, perhaps at the urging of Joseph. Verse 11 continues, Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Whenever foreign dignitaries would appear before a great king, they would bring gifts as a sign of obeisance and honor. The word treasures is probably better translated treasure chests. And as the lids were lifted, the glitter of gold and the aroma of precious spices fills the room. Gold, of course, was the most precious and valued metal known. It was highly prized. It was not found in Palestine, but had to be imported from the mines of Ophir and elsewhere. Frankincense is derived from three species of the genus Boswellia, which grow in southern Arabia, India, and elsewhere. The gum is exuded from the incised bark in pale, glittering drops. It has a bitter flavor and a strong balsamic odor when heated. The Egyptians used it for fumigation and embalming. The Israelites used it in worship in the holy place of the tabernacle and temple. Myrrh is valuable as a perfume and a constituent of sacred anointing oil. Several shrubs produce a perfumed resinous substance described as myrrh, but the one compounded in the anointing oil was probably from Comophora myrrha, or perhaps Balsamodendron myrrha, a low thorny tree distributed across South Arabia and Ethiopia. The sap is pleasantly scented and dries into a solid resin. It could be diluted to form a liquid cosmetic product and may have been used by the Egyptians in embalming. Now, these may seem inappropriate gifts for a baby, but as munificent gifts from distinguished personages appearing before a king, they would be considered quite appropriate, perhaps as specimens of the products of their country. Later Christian writers, including John's, John Hopkins Jr., who wrote We Three Kings, have seen significance in gold for Christ's royalty, frankincense for his deity, and myrrh for his humanity ultimately his burial, although none of this is in Matthew's account. I can't help but think of the song The Little Drummer Boy that came out in 1958. I have no gift to bring, rum-pa-pum-pum, that's fit to give the king. I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. Then he smiled at me, me and my drum. The song is popular, though the sentiment is profound. Our best, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is what we owe the king. And that is what characterized the Magi's gifts, an extravagant worship. Though the Magi's quest had brought Herod's scrutiny upon the child, these gifts were probably sold gradually to provide for the Holy Family during three years of exile in Egypt, where they fled to escape Herod's wrath. Well, let's pause now for discussion question three, based on uh, Matthew 2.11. Why was it appropriate for the Magi to bring gifts to the Christ child? How does the extravagance of their gifts reflect their heart attitude? What kinds of gifts are appropriate for us to bring? Pause now and then resume when you finish discussing. Verse 12 carries the story forward. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Though Herod had recruited the Magi for his evil plot, God warned them in a dream not to participate, so they left the area without returning through Jerusalem, only six miles to the north. This probably bought the Holy Family a day or two of time to make good their escape. The story concludes in verses 13 to 23 with Joseph being warned in a dream and that very night taking his young family with the treasures and fleeing for Egypt out of Herod's jurisdiction and reach. It was good that they did flee rather than question God's messenger. 
As soon as Herod discovered that the Magi had betrayed him in a furious rage, he gave orders to kill all the male children in Bethlehem who were two years of age or under. This amounted to perhaps 20 baby boys, the first martyrs for the Messiah. Why does Matthew include the story of the wise men in his gospel? There are many incidents that he chose to exclude that we find, for example, in Luke's and John's Gospels. I see in this account several important themes. First, the king heralded by a star. Matthew points to the fulfillment, without saying so, of Balaam's ancient prophecy that a star will come forth from Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel. Two, the theme of the king honored by foreign nations. One of Matthew's themes is that Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Here, the prophecy isn't cited, but only alluded to that foreign rulers will bring their riches to honor the king of Israel. This account points to Jesus' royalty as king of the Jews. Three, enemies of Christ seek his death. Here in chapter 2 is the beginning of Jesus' enemies. Herod clearly covets Jesus' claim to be Messiah and seeks to kill him before he can become a threat. Later in Matthew's Gospel, the chief priests and teachers of the law who pointed to his birthplace in Bethlehem conspire themselves to take his life. And ultimately, he is crucified for this very charge of being king of the Jews. Four, this is an explanation of Jesus' infant sojourns. From Nazareth to Bethlehem, from Bethlehem to Egypt, then back to Nazareth where he was raised. Jesus' journeys as an infant needed an explanation in the face of Jewish belittling him as a citizen of Nazareth, not from the royal city of Bethlehem. Number five, there's the theme of the gospel going to the Gentiles. This account points to another important theme that Jesus came to the Jews but had a mission beyond Israel to the Gentiles. In parable, action, prophecy, and command, Jesus underscores that the gospel must be preached to and will be embraced by the Gentiles. Let's pause now for discussion question four. For this discussion, read uh, Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Have another person read Matthew 21, 33 to 44. Another person, 22, verses 2 to 13. Another person, 24, 14. Another person, 28, 19. What do these passages have in common with each other? What relation does the visit of the wise men have to Matthew's theme of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles? And how should we be applying this mandate in our own lives. Well, pause the DVD now and then turn it on again when you've finished discussing. This passage also suggests a couple of final themes. Number six, devotion by men of wisdom. That wise men recognize the Messiah and bow at his feet is also an example in Paul's words to the wisdom of this world. And seven, the sovereignty of God. We see in Joseph an obedient servant of God who hears the angel's warnings in dreams and takes immediate action to protect the Christ child in his charge. Though the powers of this world may array themselves against Christ and his people, God is fully able of protecting and preserving them until they have completed their mission. The gifts of the wise men serve to honor the boy king and to provide for his shelter for years to come. Where one door closes, another opens. God provides. Let's pray. Father, thank you for letting us hear the story of the Magi who knelt before you with such devotion and brought you such rich and extravagant gifts. Help us to have that kind of wisdom, that we may come before you and bring you extravagant worship 
and the gifts that you've given to us. We love you, Lord Jesus. And in your holy name, we